The Millennium Dome has been dismissed by many as an expensive folly. But as Simon Thurley discovers, this is nothing new. Throughout the ages, the British have treated domes with suspicion and contempt. We live in a country of towers and spires, and that is why it's so strange that the millennium is being celebrated with an alien import, a dome. Take any view of London, and what do you see? Tall, slender buildings dominating the skyline, with one obvious exception. St Paul's Cathedral. Amazingly, this famous symbol of London is something of a rarity. There are more church domes in Rome alone than there are in the whole of Britain. But even this heroic symbol is a relatively recent addition to the city's skyline. In fact, throughout history, Britain has viewed the dome as a symbol of both foreign religions and culture, in particular, a symbol of Catholicism and the power of Rome. So when Sir Christopher Wren was invited to rebuild St Paul's after it was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666, his original designs were viewed with great suspicion. And initially, even Wren fought shy of a full dome, preferring instead to combine a dome and a spire. Now, I suspect that Wren never really intended to build this ridiculous compromise. And as the work began, the spire was conveniently forgotten and the pure form of a great dome began to rise. But the very size of the dome gave him problems. His workmen had never seen such a thing, let alone built one. And so he had to find a way of constructing it using tried and tested building techniques. And I'm now right inside the dome. And it's absolutely extraordinary. In order to create the hemispherical shape that we know today, Sir Christopher Wren was forced to build three skins the outer one of which was purely cosmetic. Structurally, the dome isn't a dome at all. The weight of the incredibly heavy stone lantern is in fact taken by a brick cone. So what we have over here is the inside of the outer skin made of lead and timber. And over here is the brick cone that is actually taking all the weight. So the whole enterprise was a cheat, and he knew that if the illusion of a dome was to be achieved, he had to conceal the brick cone, not only from the outside, but from the inside as well. And so he built a thin inner dome which mimicked the shape of the outer one, cunningly creating the illusion of a single structure rather than the three that actually existed. It was certainly a challenge, and one which he refused to be beaten by. His dome was to be the greatest engineering feat of the age, on a par, perhaps, with the building of the Channel Tunnel today. Even with the cone to hold up the weight of the lantern, Wren needed to contain the enormous sideways thrusts, and so beneath my feet he sunk a massive wrought iron chain. Further down, he used flying buttresses hidden by screen walls to contain the thrusts of the rest of the building. So, despite his visionary design, even Wren wasn't able to escape using medieval building techniques. The Dome of St Paul's was to set a trend, and before it was even finished, everybody wanted one. In North Yorkshire, in 1698, 30-year-old Charles Howard, 3rd Earl of Carlisle, set about planning one of the greatest and most extravagant houses in Europe. He chose his friend, John Vanbrugh, to design it. Vanbrugh, who wasn't an architect, wasn't exactly equipped to build a house of the style and scale that Howard wanted. And he soon realised that he was going to need an expert to draw up the plans and supervise the work. Nicholas Hawksmoor, who at the time was working as Wren's assistant and chief draftsman at St Paul's, was brought in to help. Mm -hmm. 
Together, they designed the most daring private house in England. It was topped with a dome that was to become its principal feature. Charles Howard intended the flamboyant design of the house to be a means of displaying his status. And the addition of a dome was the masterstroke, the ultimate symbol of power and wealth and an overt display of exactly how fashionable he was. Internally, the dome was to create the most sensational space yet seen in a private residence. It looks and feels more like a cathedral than a room in someone's house. Soaring high into the air, the interior is a dazzling combination of light and shade created by massive columns and the hovering dome with its rich murals. In fact, when you look at it, the hall closely resembles the interior of St Paul's, upon which Nicholas Hawksmore was still working. When the house was finally completed, Charles Howard's dream had been achieved. Castle Howard was the most daring and exciting country house in Britain. But the originality of the Castle Howard dome was to be quickly overshadowed by another. In 1714, Dr Radcliffe, Queen Anne's physician, left £40,000 for the construction of a new library. It was to be built here in the centre of Oxford, right next door to the ancient Bodleian. And Nicholas Hawksmoor, fresh from his work at Castle Howard, was determined to win the commission. He intended to create his masterpiece, a great domed library amidst Oxford's dreaming spires. St Paul's had become an international landmark, and there were many who thought that Oxford should join the elite group of cities with a dome. But sadly, Hawksmoor died and James Gibbs took over. This time, determined to build a dome of stone, a truly structural dome, unlike St Paul's or Castle Howard. But he quickly discovered that English stonemasons, who'd little or no experience in the building of domes, were simply not up to the challenge. To his disappointment, Gibbs realised that like Wren, Vanbrugh and Hawksmoor before him, he would have to compromise. His dome, too, was to be made with timber and lead and not stone. So Britain's three great domes are all illusions of solidity, majestic and monumental, but ultimately beguiling. Today, many people think the Millennium Dome is awful and artificial. But funnily enough, that's what they said about St Paul's Cathedral. But in the 1700s, awful and artificial meant full of awe and full of art. High praise indeed. 